And it's chapter 3, verses 1 to 4 that we spoke of in our invocation. Malachi says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's soap and like a launderer's fire. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. We go now to Psalm 40, verses 1 to 10. And not only does the psalmist know that God is incredible, he makes it his business to let everyone else know. Here now, let us read responsibly verses 1 to 10. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done. And your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord, you yourself. And now we go to the book of Luke on page 906 of your pew Bibles. And this is the story of the coming of John the Baptist. It's not a common one. We usually use Mark or Matthew. But John is coming anyway. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etraea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around Jordan, preaching in the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I apologize. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Don't even, don't even go there. 
Baptist without singing gospel. Come on. You really can't, and I know a lot of you wanted to join in and sing. You could have drowned me out. I would have appreciated that. Marilyn would have appreciated that. But in this season of Advent, we think that to get ourselves ready to receive the little baby Jesus, we need to think some good thoughts. We Let's think even that we might want to shine the light of, of Jesus into some of the dark places in our hearts. That's how we prepare ourselves for the Lord. Now, we all have those dark places. We all know that they're there. Perhaps if we throw a little light on those dark places, maybe they'll go away. Once upon a time, a visitor came to the Jones house. Strangely enough, the visitor looked a lot like Jesus. The Jones were overjoyed to see him. They asked if he would take, or he asked if they would take him on a tour of the house. They went into the kitchen. It was a well-worn kitchen. Not all the pots were put away, but it was clean, sparkly, and had a homey, lived-in atmosphere. Next, they went to the living room. The furniture was several years old, and the arms on Dad's barca lounger were a bit threadbare. But it was filled with family pictures, and there was a Giants football helmet next to the TV. The family had obviously spent great times watching good football. <laughs> and so the tour went. It was comfy, well-lived house. The visitor asked to see the basement. Oh no, said the Joneses. This is a storage area full of all our junk and we haven't cleaned up down there in a long time. You don't really want to get down there. It smells a bit funny. And we just couldn't let you get down. But the guest insisted. He exclaimed that that was where he did his best work. They went down for several hours, and they all worked on it, making the basement just like the rest of the house. The potential had always been there. It was just a place that had been ignored. But with Christ's help, it was ignored no more. Is that how we can prepare the way of the Lord? I think it's a great idea. Basements have quite a way of becoming cluttered, dank, and musty when we ignore them. If we took regular trips to the basements of our lives, I'm sure <coughs> things would come out in the daylight and we would be prepared. But that is not the only way we can prepare. We can think about the coming of baby Jesus and want to make ready for his arrival. But in this Christmas season, we are not only dealing with the little baby in the manger. We are dealing with the world that he came to make better. We can not only prepare the basements of our hearts, we can begin to prepare the world for the coming of the Savior. How, you may ask, I will. Well, funny you should ask. Our world is in some pretty rough shape. There are a third of a million people dead from the civil war in Syria. We have other Syrians becoming refugees looking for a place that they will not be savagely killed. We have killings in San Bernardino, which I've got to tell you, have rocked my world. It seems like mass shooting, civil war, and people dying for no good reason has become the order of the day. We compare last week's shooting in San Bernardino to the shootings at the college in last month up in Oregon to the month before somewhere else. Shootings, mass shootings, have become commonplace. <laughs> Hate is becoming a way of life. Our world is not ready for the coming of the Christ child. Now we can talk about a lot of ways to make this world better. 
We can, we can control guns. But there are millions of folks ready to take up arms to prevent that. We can give everybody a gun to defend themselves. I'm sure that wouldn't make the world much of a friendlier place. We can keep all the Muslim refugees out of the country so that a few hardcore nutballs won't come in. We can accept the refugees and hope that we can deal with whoever comes with them. We can lock up all the people with mental illness so the crazies won't be able to shoot us regular folks. We can set a test so that we can decide who's crazy and who's not, and then throw away the key. That'll certainly make our world a safer place for Christ to come. Except, didn't Christ come for everyone? There is no universal way to make our world a better place. We are one small group of folks in a small state in a country that has a small percentage of the population. Even if we could figure out how to make the world a safer, better place for everyone, how could we force the rest of the world to go along with what we think? Imagine being the thought police of the world. So how do we get the world ready for Jesus? How do we prepare the way of the Lord? How do we get people to pay attention to what we say? Priests, politicians, ministers, and kings have been trying to get people to change their minds for thousands of years without any tangible results. The world will do what the world will do, and we should leave it just as it is. Yes? If God had thought that way, Jesus would never have come. What do you think? Did Jesus come and make people change the way they were thinking? Did Jesus force folks to become Christians so that they would instantly be lovable and caring? No. That would have worked as well back then as it would work now. What Christ did was have a clean house and a clean basement and then showed it all to the world. And that is exactly what we need to do here. We can't change people's minds in San Bernardino. We can't make colleges in Oregon a safe place. But you know the old song that I'm not going to sing. They know we are Christians by our love. People, that is how we prepare for the coming of our Lord. That is how we make the world safer. That is how the town of Plymouth can change the world, make it safer, and welcome Jesus. We can start by loving each other. We start by respecting one another. We begin right here and right now by putting on our Jesus face and loving those around us. Christ was a model of love. He never did anything that was not of love. And folks, we can do the same. It's the easiest thing in the world to criticize, to blame, to search out disagreement, to believe you are right and everybody else is wrong, to fight with some idiot who disagrees with you, to give the one-finger salute to another driver having a bad day, to tell everyone that your boss is an idiot, and the list goes on and on and on and on. It is easy to be unhappy with the world as it sits. It is much, much harder to make the world safe for Christ. It's easy to react to somebody who doesn't like you. It's much tougher to put on your Jesus face and love your enemies. That is what we are called to do. Our conference minister, Kent Salati, has sent an email to all the churches in the conference. I would like to share it with you. He says, these are difficult days. We feel at a loss in so many ways to know how to respond or what to say or more importantly, what to do. I don't think there are any easy answers, but I do have a sense that God is weeping over what is happening in our world. 
We are called to be God bearers and gospel proclaimers in this time. Our mission and ministry continue to be centered in gospel hope in the midst of the great despair and violence that surrounds us. Our witness must be a powerful one of proclaiming love and justice and of working for change to transform God's world into a more just, loving, and compassionate place. Our witness is critical at this time. In this season of Advent, we wait. But our waiting is not a time of inaction. It is a time to allow our hearts to be broken open once again to the incarnation of God into the midst of pain and suffering, of warfare and violence, of doubt and derision, God came as a child. Into our pain and suffering, warfare and violence, God comes again. <clears throat> this week we hear about John the Baptist, a wild thing, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's a very fine way for all of us <clears throat> to prepare for this season. God Forgive us. Move us to a new way of being. God, help us together to make a difference in your name. The Reverend Eric Anderson offers this prayer. Holy One, God of peace, God of justice, God of love, we come to you in penitent confession. You called us to bear witness to you, to your ways of healing, to your ways of care, to your ways of compassion, to your ways of peace. This we have not done. You called us to feed your sheep, to feed your lambs, to feed your children. This we have not done. You called us to build a city on a hill, one that could not be hid, where the lion could lie down with the lamb. This we have not done. We have seized on reason after reason, to equip ourselves for death, for power, for prestige, to equip ourselves with resources or wealth, for pride or protection, for posturing or revenge, for creed or state or family or clan or... We hear these reasons echo hollowly in the dread silence following another rash of killings. We bow our heads in sorrow and in grief. <clears throat> Let your mercy unto us, O God, not be a bomb for wounded spirits, but drive and energy to change our ways. As you cried, enough of this! When your disciple lashed out with the sword, may we raise our voices, echoing, enough. As you told your friends that the greatest among them would always be the one who served, may we extend our hearts and hands to all the lonely, all the lost, all the ones who feel they are beyond the bounds of human care. As you told us, when we do good or ill to any person, we do that good or ill to you. May we see in every human being a child of God, one of our family, a bearer of your grace. Do not comfort us until we make this world a better place. Let your comfort rest upon the wounded, who those who lament for loved, one, loved ones lost, those whose bodies, minds, and spirits face the rocky road of recovery. Let your comfort rest upon the ones who rush to protect, to bandage, or to heal, and may your power restore the souls who suffer from exposure to such trauma. Let your comfort rest upon the ones who will journey with the wounded, with the grieving, with the suffering, so that they might serve and serving know your grace. Let us, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, agnostics, followers of uncounted faiths around the world, or adherents to no faith at all, let us together reshape our constellation of societies, forsaking the ways of violence and death, embarking on the paths of peace. Aid us, O God. Amen. Let may we prepare the way of the Lord. And let it begin with me. Let it begin with me. Let us, this Advent, renew our commitment to one another. Not in a superficial way, not in a pretend way, not in a way that we think others will love. 
Let us stretch ourselves. Let us remake ourselves. Let us think new thoughts and make our small piece of the world a place where Jesus is welcome and that we are truly prepared by our love. Let our love shape our actions. Let our love be a beacon to the town of Plymouth. When others see us, let them think how strange we are, how unconforming we are. Let us heed the words of Romans 12 when Paul says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. People, let us simply love one another in any and every way that we can. Let us put anger and frustration aside and instead cover it with love. A great way to start is by going to the Christmas walk this afternoon when we will show our love to the whole town of Plymouth. Then do something totally out of the blue for someone else. At Dunkin' Donuts, pay for somebody else's coffee. Don't get frustrated with the clerk at the DMV. <laughs> You're laughing. That's the impossible. Over tip tremendously. It is in showing our love that we show Christ's love. It is in our showing love that we defeat those without love. We cannot change the whole world. We cannot change San Bernardino. But we can change us. We can change <coughs> what we do. We can change everything about ourselves. We don't have to be selfish. We don't have to be angry. We don't have to be unhappy. I have told you for years that God did not put us on this place to be miserable. God did also not put us here to help make others miserable. Let us be a beacon to the town of Plymouth. Let us start to make a world of love. Let us start to make a world where anger, where frustration, where discontent can go live somewhere else. We can't help people in San Bernardino we throw up our hands and have no idea what we can do, but we can change things here. This is your home. These are people you see every day. Let us change Plymouth so that anger and peace.